where we speak with experts, leaders, and change makers about movements of social change that have transformed the landscape of Canada and the way we live our lives. We're sitting today in the Vancouver office of Joel Solomon, chairman of Renewal Funds, Canada's largest social venture capital fund. I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, Jews in the South, which and in the, what was considered the Bible Belt of the South. So that had its factors, and it was civil rights era. I'm 60 now, so I was born in 54. Right. So I grew up when Jim Crow was still in place, colored bathrooms and water fountains and all of that, very confusing. And then being a Jew was its own odd placement, lots of attempts to sure. proselytize and convert me and all that kind of stuff. And um, then the 60s came, and I would say my aspirations at the time, my, my family, my father was the son of an immigrant, of immigrants, who had worked his way up. And uh, by the 60s, though, I didn't really have a grasp of all that, as we forget. And he got ultimately into the shopping mall business. And um, I learned a lot. Developer at shopping malls? He was a developer at okay. shopping malls. Started in the movie theater business. They had a drive-in theater blow down in a tornado and decided to use that site for the first shopping center in Tennessee. And it went on to become the largest in the country for a, a period of time. Mm. And uh, I was affected by the uh, things that were going on in the larger world, the anti-war movement, and, and my family was political always. They had an attitude of, it's important to take responsibility, uh, bad things can happen. It's better to mm. be involved and help see that better outcomes occur. So I had exposure early on to the importance of politics, the importance of business, or the value of business, and how you can work your way up, so to speak, and make things happen. And then my mother, as I mentioned to you before the interview, is an artistic photographer right. who started when I was in my early teens to teach herself photography and went on to be the first one-woman show by a living woman at the Museum of Modern Art. Mm -hmm and uh, was also a really important influence in the midst of that. My father was business ambition guy. and yeah. business guy and go forward. My mother w became artist and seeker and explorer and questioner. And her work, in a, her name is Rosalind Solomon, her work in a nutshell is something like following her instincts around the world and, and locally and regionally and photographing people and their circumstances of mm -hmm. all classes, and really, uh, to some degree, conveying a lot of the pathos. And I think what I eventually derived from it was an understanding of bigger global issues through the eyes of those photographs and seeing upper class and lower class and all of that kind of stuff. Amazing. So, and so, and then when you started, you said in your, when did you start getting more politically interested? Well, I grew up licking envelopes and, and oh, you uh, putting up okay. signs in political campaigns. Okay. And uh, my parents had met on a blind date to the 1952 Democratic Convention after my father's candidate from Tennessee, originally from Chattanooga, who was Senator Estes Kefauver, lost to Adelaide Stevenson. Mm -hmm. He became Stevenson's uh, VP nominee in 56. But in any case, the night after he lost, my father got a blind date with my mother, and they carried on a nine-month long-distance relationship, driving 16 hours between Chicago and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah, sure, yeah. And um, he was already in his 30s, and I just asked her about this this week. Uh, she was 23, and all of her friends were already married and having babies. And she went for it and moved to the South. Wow. So anyhow, those were important influences early in my life, and I got exposure to some breadth. Now, there's another important part of the story, yeah. which is my father is from a family with a, a polycystic kidney disease gene, and many people in the family died from it at fairly young ages. And my father had it, and uh, some years later, in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with it. But I knew about this thing in, in my family, and um, at the time, I just probably stuck my head in the sand and didn't want to think about it. But over time, that became a tremendous uh, helper to me because facing mortality caused me to actually think about what mattered to me. Mm. At and a very young was, age already. At a very young age. What, yeah. what am I going to do with my life and how can I make it useful and do something that matters? So, so. And so 
What did you study at university? Did you go to university? I went to university. I started at Columbia for one year. I thought I wanted to be in New York City. I did, but Columbia still had a fairly classical education, and I was not very attracted to that. And so I moved to Vassar up, uh, up the Hudson Valley and graduated there. However, in the middle of my university uh, time, um, I did a summer internship for Jimmy Carter, who was the former one-term governor of Georgia, chairing the Democratic Party campaign committee. That's something that candidates, potential presidential candidates do, because they travel around the country and hold fundraisers and help congressional candidates and others, and they make contacts. Okay. So I was a summer intern there working for the young thir the 30 year olds, young 30 year olds who were the future chief of staff and press secretary of the White House. And um, at the end of the summer, they said, Jimmy's going to run for president. Will you help us? And so that began uh, another era, which ties back to university because by my, uh, well, I went to my professors and Poli sci, I was a political science uh, major. That seemed like a good mm -hmm. thing to do from the family I came from. Wasn't sure about business at the time. Oh, you weren't yet, okay. Not at all. There was a lot of pressure okay. to go into the family business. And politics actually partially gave me a way out from that pressure because it was acceptable in my family. Um, so I began traveling around New England from Vassar and uh, finding young Democrat clubs on college campuses and saying, hi. I'm working for a guy that's running for president. Who? 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 <laughs> uh, well, he's going to come to campus, and uh, if we could get 20 or 30 people together to hear what he has to say, or later it became one of his sons or other surrogates, and so I would drive them around uh, with, a, of course, a big focus on New Hampshire, the uh, first primary, Yes. but, but uh, all around there. And so I talked to my professors, and I said, I've read the 17-page strategy document that tells how Jimmy Carter's going to win the nomination and become president. And uh, who, Jimmy, who? Who? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think this would be a good part of my political science major if you would let me get all my classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays and be able to travel and work in the campaign, which I did. Well, I would say the summary of this is I saw somebody who was basically pretty minor sit down and figure out a plan mm -hmm. and become the leader of, at least at that time, the most uh, powerful nation on the planet, and do it with a bunch of very young people. And uh, But my work there was to, I uh, went around to primary and caucus states and was an organizer. I was the uh, national youth coordinator for a period. And the plum job I got was during the general election, Jimmy Carter decided as an outsider, he ran as an outsider to Washington. And he was the first presidential candidate, at least in modern times, to not have his headquarters in Washington. So he had it in Atlanta. But there was one, they had to have an office in Washington. And I ended up during the general election in the Congressional Relations Office, mm. being sent in my early 20s to talk to members of Congress in their 60s who'd been in office for 30, 30 terms, 25 terms, things like that to coordinate their campaign with the presidential campaign. And this is just the ridiculousness of what goes on in this kind of politics, is all these young people and yeah. end up dealing with things so far out of our leagues. <laughs> Did you feel that at the time? Though? Absolutely. <laughs> I got sent to organize the Bronx in my first job. Yeah. And in New York, and I'd been at Columbia, don't, in back then it was, don't ever ride the subway above, you know. <laughs> and I went in, to a 97% uh, Latino and black congressional district to meet the party boss, to who, again, this is early, who had no idea who Jimmy Carter was. Yeah. Anyway, I, I realized fairly quickly that I was in the wrong uh, roles, especially there, that it wasn't right to send me into that congressional district to try to speak. Uh, so interesting. And yeah. so I ended up getting transferred to Mississippi uh, into the congressional district that Charles Evers, the brother of Medgar Evers, who was one of the four students who'd been murdered in the civil rights era, um, in a town where one side of the street was the black cafe and the other side of the street was the white cafe. And Anyhow, I had a lot of really fascinating experiences, yeah. really interesting things, and Carter won by a hair and became president.
Uh, but and then how soon after did you move to Canada? Or was okay. That was so after that, then over the, the next little period of time, I got diagnosed with the kidney okay, disease. That's good. And when I was diagnosed, it was you you could die very soon, you could live longer. Right. There's nothing you could do about it. Those words, uh, which are my memory's not all that good for detail, but I remember those words really sure well. I remember those. Yes. And um, it led me on a seeking and searching thing because I, I wasn't. It was back to the family business and the pressure starting to build. Okay, the presidential campaign's over. Are you going to go work in the White House? Are you going to come work in the business? And I think what I saw during the campaign was that a 23-year-old, the kind of jobs that were being offered, I, I needed to know. I needed to know something. I didn't really know enough to, to go do that. Anyhow, the first order of business was to try to explore health alternatives. Mm -hmm. Because I've been told there's nothing you can do. Well, that's not very empowering. No. And I felt like I should do something. So I went through all of the alternative uh, health things that you can think of, checking them out, asking questions. Um, and eventually I decided, came to the conclusion. I got actually met through his publisher because I wrote a letter. Andrew Weil, who is leading complementary health guy now, but he was after his first book, an unknown. But I, I can't remember why, but I was called to write to him, and and I got to spend a weekend with him, where he basically said moderation, Western medicine plus complementary medicine, work on your psychologically, your emotional, and your spiritual, like have love in your life, have good relationships, be a good person, you got a better chance. And so that said, that got me another step to where after Carter got elected, I decided I wanted to go do something physical because if I was going to die, you know, living in my brain didn't... Anyway, I needed to experience that too. So I got a job on a ranch in Jackson Hole, and then I went to a gardening workshop in Northern California that actually became uh, gave me a lot of business principles, which it's called French Intensive Biodynamic, and it is about diversity, complexity. There are elements bigger than you. You can't control it all. Generosity, share. There's always abundance in gardens if done well. And treat the soil well. And it's all about the soil. Treat the soil well. It's a living being. Uh, it is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You will get much healthier uh, plants. And so that was uh, that led me west. That led you west because that, that that was in California. In California. Okay. In Northern California. And uh, the three people, there were three people in my five-week gardening course. And one of them, uh, later, I went back to Washington, D.C. because my father was in a very heated um, circumstance where there was lots of scandal in his agency. Oh. And he decided the thing to do was to make it public and go after it. So there was lots of congressional hearings and Senate hearings and things. And the interesting detail was I knew all the people working in the White House. He was just getting to know them. And so it became, it, it lured me back one more time. So I went and spent some time uh, working on an organic farm in West Virginia, half time, selling vegetables outside the uh, three blocks away from the large building that he had been appointed as the administrator of the General Services Administration. I know this is too many stories, but. No, this is good. I'm listening. But, yeah. um, in any case, I worked there for a while until he was forced to resign as the scandals uh, climbed wow. up the ladder. And you couldn't, you couldn't tackle them. They were uh, just getting too big. Well, the deeper story there oh, yeah. is that there was a, a congressman, the Speaker of the House, who was very powerful, named Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts. And his right-hand guy was the top bureaucrat at the GSA. And um, my father ended up firing him because he couldn't get information. Mm -hmm. He couldn't find out what was going on. And on camera, I will make no more further speculations, but I'll say when my father fired him, he was rehired at the White House. And Tip o Carter was in a lot of trouble with Congress, running as an outsider yeah. and coming in. And he was under a lot of pressure at the time. And they made a political decision to uh, ask my father to resign. Mm -hmm. They brought in a retired admiral and about six months later declared the scandals cleaned up, and that was the end of that. So it's a good lesson. Yeah, seriously. Wow. And so that, and then, and then where are you now? So you, are you still being pulled into business politics? Are you still in organic farming? Are you? So I'm getting called <laughs> by 
the natural world yeah. and f- working with my body because there's still the health diagnosis. Right. And the shopping mall industry wasn't looking any better at the time. And uh, one of the people who had been in that three-person workshop with had found herself on Cortez Island. And she said, I've found this incredible place. You really got to come. You got to come. You got to come. You got to come. And uh, What year was this? Around? Uh, I think we're in uh, 77. Carter had been elected. And I had decided I was... No, 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 no. Back 79. Uh, by 1980, I crossed the border the okay. first time. Okay. March of 1980, and went straight to Cortez Island. Um, met my first wife sitting there um, uh, that day, and um, really was captured and enamored by it. And I was enjoying that experience of more silence and introspection, a lot of reading, learning different kinds of things, because I was now outside the kind of funnel that I had been prepped for and born into. And um, it was an, it was a, a group of people living on, uh, on Cortez Island with a, in a farming community. The downside was that the politics of intentional community were more uh, pain, they were just, they were the same politics as I'd been in in Washington, mm-hmm. except much less sophisticated. Right. And you know who's going to cook dinner, and how come you left, and the thing out on the table, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And I was frustrated. I didn't really want. There was too much noise. So a guy came through saying that there uh, is this amazing place north of here that is an orca research laboratory, and uh, there's hydrophones in the water, and you know you turn the, the tape recorders on when the orcas come, and they're deciphering uh, orca language and figuring out who they are as individuals and learning a lot about it because they are the largest brained uh, mammal on the planet per wet body weight, and there's a lot to learn there. And they have trouble finding caretakers. So I said, okay, can I have his address? I wrote, and he said, well, why don't you come next week? So I proceeded, uh, not knowing how to drive a boat, not or run a <laughs> chainsaw, to take care of an island 45 minutes from Alert Bay, which is a Kwakil Nation uh, village primarily and um, ended up with a lot of reflective time and bringing boxes of books from, you know, I'd go to the city once or twice a year and buy a box of books and read and think and whatever. How many people were in that same area where you were? Often it was me alone, then uh, Louise, that that future wife was their son. And then in the summers there was a lot of activity of researchers and uh, people with all kinds of interests in the orcas because you could, the, the orcas were very close at hand there. Orcas are very far removed from the world of, of business and, um, yeah, real estate, all that. They are so development, all that all their, Yeah. Well, here's the, okay, good question. So during all that reflective period and reading and understanding, well, how did the world get to be the way it was? How did North America get to be the way it was? How did capitalism evolve? How did, what was colonialism? What was the patriarchy? You know, all the, the, these types of concepts and what was, what was nature's role and what was happening. And, you know, I was born when there were two and a half billion people on the planet. Mm-hmm. There's seven billion now. There's going to be ten billion while you're still alive, hopefully. Um, but in thinking about it all, I concluded that money and business, through good intention of hardworking people that wanted better life for their families and, and these kinds of things, had um, some side effects called externalities and a lot of things that were unknown also. We didn't know there was limits. And, uh, or maybe we did, but it seemed that we act as if there weren't. Um, and um, I felt that it was important that I had been born with the privilege and access into what had become a very successful business that, that the most useful thing I could actually do is go back in mm-hmm. and keep my values and be willing to be different. I had my mother as a very yeah. unique character to be a model, along with my father who was successful in his business. And that was when the seed happened. Mm-hmm. Um, within another period, short period of time, my father was sick and dying from the kidney mm-hmm. disease. So I went back to Tennessee and uh, was with him through that last period. And then uh, my sister and I ended up with He had gone in the government, come back out, so the once large empire was now in the hands of cousins. 
but he had started back up and he had mm -hmm. some real estate holdings and things. And so I adapted myself uh, physically, appearance-wise, uh, language-wise, in every other way to start learning how to deal with what to do. I, I, I inherited $3 million. Um, that seemed like a vast, vast sum of money, as I now know. It is very, very affluent. It is tiny in the world of big wealth. Right. Um, you can't do that much if you're trying to change the world. Were you trying to change the world at that time? So I'd gone back saying, well, I have to use this in ways that are generative and create things that will heal rather than harm. And um, I had the training of an entrepreneurial background. And so I started with very small investments. I mentioned to you earlier in Nashville, we started the first modern coffee place. That was putting together $100,000 at the time to launch what's now a very successful coffee roasting and cafe business that owns real estate and other things. But um, I just learned my way in. You learned your way into investing, though, because you didn't I really have that as I learned my way a... in. I knew basic, I had exposure to basic business, business, which is a huge privilege just on its own. And you can, once you know a certain amount, you can, you can yeah, okay. find your way in. But the way that I learned was, I made, my very first investment was in Stonyfield, in the beginning of Stonyfield Farm Yogurt Company. Mm -hmm. And it had started as a, as a, social uh, mission to try to save small family farms and one of the co-founders had been at Gary Hirschberg mm -hmm. had been at the new Alchemy Institute which was about appropriate technology and alternative energy and fish farming for greenhouse uh, growing and all the stuff that has finally gotten prominence now renewable energy organic agriculture right. uh, not wasting resources and um, so this was like this was a company founded on we are going to build a company that's going to have the right practices is going to be about organics we're going to help clean up agriculture uh, reduce toxins on workers and give children in particular a healthy product instead of chemical laden fossil fuel grown right food so that was the beginning okay. and and i used small investments in early entrepreneurs that were doing things I considered innovative and pushing the edge. And I handled the parts. In, in, like in the coffee business, I knew how to deal with the legal, the accounting, the politics, meaning zoning and things like that, and by, uh, bylaws and things. And uh, raising money, I could I could put together 10,000 here. To, and I knew, I knew how to handle that stuff. I didn't try to go inside and tell them what to do. Right. And we used to make partnerships that were effectively 50% to the operators who put up no cash, all sweat equity, that they got the 50% after they paid back the initial investment. And um, that felt like a fair model to me. And these businesses were replacing, like there was barely existent places to go hang out and talk to people. And um, that it was the early stage of the coffee movement in Nashville. It was the beginning. So I did, and then with Gary Hirschberg, I would travel to New Hampshire and I would just spend time with him, be sure not to be a nuisance or hope I wasn't a nuisance, and find things I could do to help, like make introductions, or just listen to him, uh, or physically, you know, help move crates and things like that. And I would travel around with him. And so I learned business, um, I guess you could say, entrepreneurially and through through actually hands-on that part of the investment part. Okay, and so when did, what came first, Hollyhock or Renewal? Like when did you, which came Well, Hollyhock was part of the story because I'd gone to Cortez Island bef two years before Hollyhock was founded and had helped volunteer in the gardens. Okay. And then when Hollyhock started, founded by Greenpeace founders and humanistic psychology uh, practitioners, the inner and the outer, change the world, make it better, better humans, better world. Um, that had a huge influence on me, and it was the first place I really anchored with life purpose, getting clear. So I got involved with Hollyhock then. I came back to, ten, and that was in 82. I came back, to, and I put my, I inherited $50,000 back then. I put 25 in Stonyfield, 25 in Hollyhock. And that was my way to clean up that money. Got it, yes. And, um, but when my father died, I went back to Tennessee and uh, stayed there basically a decade figuring out how to, taking care of the estate issues, and then starting to adapt 
from shopping malls to one mile radius strategy. And I joined some networks that were national and got me exposed to the early era of social enterprise, social venture, mm-hmm. all, which was the social venture network. Mm-hmm. And um, at the social venture network, I was able to effectively sit at the knees of the early pioneers of organic food and organic skincare and businesses that are designed intentionally to make the world better because of their product and make money. Right. And then also to the nonprofit uh, social enterprise sectors and, and, and that kind of thing. And then from Social Venture Network, a uh, lineage of other organizations spun out. You know, Judy Wicks didn't like Stonyfield selling, or didn't like Ben & Jerry selling to big company. And she started the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, mm-hmm. which is all about localism. And the group that wanted to do actual investing, not just hear inspirational stories and help out each other, started Investor Circle. And then uh, imp- uh, Net Impact uh, started as let's go to business schools and teach you know, alternative influence about what business, okay. et cetera, et cetera. So those became learning networks for me. I stayed involved with Hollyhock, which became a practice spot to offer learning, lifelong learning for inner skills and work in the world. And um, the key detail was that I met Carol Newell during that period. Right. During that period, okay. Through another network. Okay. Uh, back in, this is by the early 90s. Okay. So in the 80s, I was metamorphosizing, yeah. making uh, small individual investments, and doing a lot of learning. Mm-hmm. In the 90s, I met uh, Carol. And Carol had inherited a much larger amount of money and a beautiful and extraordinary vision, which was that she had no idea why she should have $50 million, which was talked about publicly many times, so I can say that. Mm-hmm. But And she wanted the majority of it to go into uh, social goods. And um, I became the partner invited to strategize and implement a program that grew over time and became a model of, we called it an activist family office. Uh, I, we realized that stories was really the product, mm-hmm. that we were too small. It, you know, I said three million is a small amount, 50 million is a tiny amount, changing the world. And that stories were probably the thing that could have the most impact, as long as they're real, or real stories. But the number of zeros would be forgotten in history but the fact that there were people who tried and who reinvented a part of capitalism that could be more balanced uh, for people and planet and community. And uh, one thing led to another, but with that opportunity, I took a one mile radius strategy into a regional strategy and was invited to here, which was British Columbia basically, and have a for-profit investment entity that was mission first, a charitable foundation that experimented with pushing the edges of the use of the asset base to do investments that were aligned with the work that of the issue, to, with the same work that we were using in trying to make grants to solve the problems created by our investments. This is one of the contradictions that lives in the foundation world and the charitable laws as they were created because people invest in a normal way without looking at what those investments are doing besides the financial part and then trying to solve the problems with a tiny little bit of money. So we we tried to flip that and and do uh, loans to nonprofits, uh, buying real estate with nonprofits or trying to do conservation development work where you put some houses but protect a large area. And uh, that led into the Great Bear Rainforest and the idea of the largest conservation development transaction ever done on the planet, which is mm-hmm. the entire coast of Canada above Vancouver Island, uh, that uh, brought together all different parties to create a protected area that has investment in First Nations and Aboriginal peoples' um, economic well being in the area so that the people are also part of conservation, which was landmark in the history of conservation. Mm -hmm. 
So those were some of the kinds of things. And then there's two other parts oh, to yeah, that yeah. strategy, yeah. Yeah. which was inner skills, okay. leadership. Like I never forgot that part from Andy Weil. Of if you don't have a solid foundation of knowing how to deal with conflict or knowing how to be a good parent or a good partner or all this kind of stuff, and basically a good person, you can learn the mechanics of business. You can make a lot of money. And you can do a lot of damage because your your heart, your feelings, your emotional maturity may not keep up with your financial and intellectual maturity. And I think it's a flaw in modern education that we're not taught uh, how to deal with those realms and who we are as a being and why we're doing what we're doing. So Hollyhock became the representation of that, and we made a major investment. Carol made a major investment that took Hollyhock from what was probably going to be a fading away idealistic dream mm -hmm. into a serious idealistic dream that is more <laughs> <laughs> that has lasted for 30 something years now. So if I asked you what is the mission of Hollyhock? Today we state it a little differently because we work on mission statements, but <laughs> to inspire, nourish, and support people who are making the world better. Okay. Carol and I were able to bring through Renewal Partners, which was our investment entity, um, was a concept of crafted gatherings, otherwise known as conferences, um, that brought together people from multiple sectors, because there's too much siloing, and so they could, because you need a whole system, mm -hmm. intergenerational, because young people and old people don't get to spend that, uh, and peer learning, because every conference and meeting I ever go to still is people on stage talking while people do email or <laughs> hold their shoulders like this. And we don't do much speakers, okay. um, uh, thinking it's a better learning model. And then when you go somewhere where there's no, you can't get away, you're there for five days, right. then you've got a full morning to night, and you can offer uh, meditation and yoga in the mornings to those who want, and you can have uh, dance parties uh, at night to those who want. Mm -hmm. And out of these kind of cultural moments that might be somewhere in between the festival world, the intentional festival world, Burning Man being the best known, mm -hmm. and business conference. And that's sort of where we try to hit, which I think translates to better people, better companies, better communities, and practical skills, but mostly a relational field. Um, this is what I think has been part of a number of things that have happened in British Columbia and generally the West Coast of Canada, I guess, and another way I like to think of it, um, that has helped speed along uh, the incredible dynamic effectiveness of the environmental movement here, of environmentalists and First Nations alliances that have happened, of legal supports for First Nations and their winning legal battles that are therefore now becoming the more important part of environmental issues, of nonprofit sector getting to know small business people right. and for-profit so that they're not locked in the nonprofit ghetto where they only learn nonprofit skills. They get exposed to how for-profit people do. And these are for-profit people who are in business because they have a vision about making the world better. So they get to stay in touch with what's going on in, in uh, the nonprofit sectors so that as they get swept up into business, they don't lose and forget or know how. Because again, I know I've said this a few times, but we get so segment sectored that everybody in a certain kind of uh, animation industry, they know each other really well, they hang out together. They don't know anybody anywhere else. Right. So I think this is a type of cultural organizing that leads to social change, social impact, and innovation. And what we don't do is hold a conference to solve a problem. Get 100 people in a room with all different backgrounds and okay, now let's figure this out over the... There's a role for that, but what there's too little of is actually building deep trust and relationships and understanding of things broader than our specialty. And uh, I believe in that very much. And in terms of, I would imagine, if I asked you what your proudest moments, proudest accomplishments in, in the whole span that you've done a lot of stuff over the years, <laughs> would Hollyhock be one of them? Would would your 
you know, I would, I would be I'm sitting I'm deeply audience. emotionally attached to yeah. Holly Hawk. I later recruited the CEO who became my current wife. And um, I, I just, it's meant so much to me. And I, the experience of going there and seeing people come and then what goes on through their days there. And there's just a lot of meaningful yeah. part for me. Um, I'm not a part of, I don't attend organized religion. Uh, this is not that, but it gives me a sense of community and purpose and that kind of thing. But I would say my proudest accomplishment mm. is that I managed to break out of a mold that I had been put in through good intentions and actually figure out what mattered about life and was able, somewhat because of some affluence probably and all kinds of other privileges, but to be able to choose a pathway that was different and to be able to stick with it long enough to really figure out what it was I was doing and why and, and why it worked and get better at it. And so I took me out of becoming a major damaging force on the planet. If I had gone down the path that was prepped for me, I could have built a hundred shopping malls. Shopping malls have their advantage, you know, they're good things. I'm not going to get into analyzing. I'll just say, me accumulating wealth to accumulate wealth has so many negative side effects that we prefer and we are condoned not to look at. And the, the revolution that is underway right now is about cleaner money. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing I like to say is I'm actually a social change investor. And uh, impact investing is, is, is good, and it's the term that evolved. And, uh, but what's a social change investor? So it's a lot of the things I've told you. It's about integrating, thinking about systemic change and investing in multiple different ways, charitable, for-profit, sponsorship, scholarship, events, curating, hosting, all of that kind of stuff. But um, out of Renewal Partners, which was a $14 million professional seed fund that worked primarily in this region but beyond in our networks. We said our version of local is geographic and relational. Mm -hmm. um, and because we need to learn and we need trade and mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to all end up that, you know, that wouldn't be the goal. Right. Um, and mission first, this has got to be about something. You want money from us? What are you going to do when you make $10 million or $100 million? What are you going to do with it? Why do you want to make $100 million? Well, I, you know, a lot of people say, because I want to do good with it and I want to give away money. So then I'd say, okay, are you, you, sh you know, how, when? $100 million, $10 million, billion? And, you know, I think about it. In other words, we want to know we're involved with people who that there's a reason to make money besides only to make money. Right. This is not to belittle. You know, there are people in conditions that need to make money. But entrepreneurs are generally, generally come from fairly privileged backgrounds, or they get themselves into elite places and they get all the tools and, and benefits. <coughs> so how much is enough was the question. And that was a question Carol and I asked a lot. How much is enough? Um, so back to Renewal Partners. In about uh, 2008, the uh, task that Carol wanted done, we deployed the $20 million foundation. It had grown over the 14 years. We put much more than that out the door, but we spent it down. We invested in Tides Canada's birth mm -hmm. and growth as a long-term capacity building social enterprise because the $20 million foundation, as big as that sounds to people that don't move in those worlds, is a drop in the bucket. Right. Most of them just give away a little bit of the earnings, and they go on into the future and clog up desks, and you know, and they generally don't do anything that interesting. They can, but um, Tides is a social enterprise which is a revenue model that helps build the charitable sector and organizations in the charitable sector, which hopefully can grow and grow. Um, but on the for-profit side. We had gotten a lot of experience in working with entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. made many, many dozens of investments. And those of us on the investment team really liked that. And with Carol's 
backing as a minority partner now, not as the sole money, we went out to raise money from other people. And in uh, the middle of, as the recession started, we kicked this off. And by 2010, two and a half years, we had raised uh, $35 million for a fund, Mission First, focused on organic food, clean consumer products, and green technologies. Not renewable energy and big tech, but because our money's not big enough to do that. Um, but uh, software, uh, we're, in, we're in water testing analytics and storm water management and animal tracking uh, for scientific purposes mm -hmm. and, and uh, fiberglass windows and things like that. Um, we deployed that portfolio and built the companies in it and then in uh, 2014 we raised 63 million dollars in a year to do it again. Huh. And uh, we have no major institutional investors, just individuals, families, and some charitable foundations. And this is a fund targeted for uh, internal rates of return in the, in the mid-teens. And we think it's doable. And we're in industries that are changing their industry. We're in, su we're in sectors that are okay, changing their yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. And they're growing very well. So we think this can be a model for other people to do it smarter and better. Um, we don't know where we'll go with it, but um, it's now a real business, and I'm proud of having helped create that with a great team here uh, so that uh, Canada has another player that is putting capital out this way. And so where is it now and, and, and moving forward? Are you, is it already you raised all of that? You We've raised all the 63. All okay. uh, we finished last year. We, we, we start raising money once we've stopped putting new companies in. Okay. Uh, we haven't finished taking care of them and maybe investing further in them, but we're not getting new companies, so there's no okay. conflict between okay. one fund and the next. So then we're we're already eight companies in in a less than a year and a half, which is a really rapid pace. Yeah. So what will we do next is what you asked. Um, my personal mission statement now is to be part of influencing the movement of trillions of dollars from destructive practices to generative practices. I believe this is already underway and done. I don't think that's a very bold mission statement, actually, but it sounds grand. It does sound grand. Um, and uh, but because there is a wave of people now underway on this, mm -hmm. and we have been part of it, and I feel very proud of having been part of it, and maybe even being an elder uh, in in that world now, and the job is to pass on everything possible. That's why I say yes to these kinds of interviews. I want uh, younger people to know that there are alternative pathways. I want people that are part of the 30 to $50 trillion intergenerational transfer of wealth that is gonna happen in New North America alone in the next 30 years. I want those people, whether they are the remaining spouse or the children or whatever beneficiaries, including big charities and institutions and universities, you got to get your money into things that are aligned with what your values and purpose are. Now there's a problem, there's not enough products and the world can't service all that yet, mm. but you've got to keep asking and uh, young smart people need to invent more products and create a whole new financial industry. Because that's hopefully coming. Hopefully coming, and I see it everywhere. Okay. So I don't know what we'll do next. We will either do renewal four. Oh, you might still do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll probably do. The, we've built a team now of younger people, and they um, love it. And so if that all fits together, we'll they probably raise another fund. We don't want it to get too big. If you get too big, you have to write bigger checks. Mm. If you have to write bigger checks, it's all more in, intense. And we're trying to model and influence, not own it all. So there's that. And then the other thing we could do is be part of the next innovations. Because now we have a base of investors, a reputation, a skill set, and uh, clarity about what we're doing with our lives and why. Or at least more clarity. That always changes and evolves. So we could partner or... Um, I'm involved also personally, uh, as a number of us are, in other emerging tools and products 
in, in these worlds because mm -hmm. it's clearly a uh, a time. It's 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 a boom time in changing the way money works in the world. And you're heading that. You're sort of leading that in a sense. Uh, I do, what I, I, I do what I can. I think so. <laughs> and you do what you can, but yeah, absolutely. I think there's that. I like to say, all in. I'm all. Um, we are all ancestors, and we've got to remember that. This is a forgotten piece of knowledge that everybody used to know that you came from somewhere, and there's people coming after us, and we are affecting that future. And uh, I think we have generational responsibilities. That the sooner we figure out that we have them, the better our life will be and the more satisfying and the more uh, productive it'll be that it's our job now to look after the future generations that we don't know. And we're in a time, those of us alive on the planet today are in a time where the ability to destroy things is vastly bigger than all the previous generations lived with. That's what's unique about, that is what is, a, is actually exceptional about mm. this period of time. Everybody alive or who may see anything you produce out of this interview are living at a time where we are the ones that are responsible to turn that around and use it for good. Thank you. You're welcome. Good message. Thank you for joining us today on the History of Social Change podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Birnbaum, publisher and editor of Sea Change magazine and producer of the History of Social Change project. Be sure to stay tuned as we discuss other social change movements that have transformed the landscape of Canada and the way we live our lives.